it's a real uh, nice opportunity to come and share some information about a virus that was only discovered in 2008 and for which um, uh, I've been very lucky to be centered here at the wonderful University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance Nexus with Dr. Paul Niem, who I would like to mention early and often, who is um, an internationally known referral expert, clinician, dermatologist, oncologist, who attracts these patients. So as we're going to learn about a little bit more, this is a rare disorder, but this paradigm of infection-related cancers, and it's thought that uh, that we know of, about 15% of all cancers are, are known to be related to an infection. This is one of the more recent examples of a direct linkage between um, an infection and cancer and uh, may provide uh, um, new ways of thinking about that and, and avenues for therapy. So um, in my talk today, well, this picture does happen to be from northern India, and I'm actually going there in a couple of days to uh, a conference in Delhi, but uh, no other vanity slides for the talk. Um, I'm going to be uh, speaking about a virus I've only worked on for a few years. So because of that, I'm going to give you some background um, in the virus and um, in the rapid advances there, including um, touching on some material that other faculty members here are involved with and you may have heard about recently. And then about the latter third of the talk will be research that I've been more directly involved with, finishing with a translational component where actually knowledge of the immune response to this um, malignancy-related virus basically T cells directed at this virus have been infused about two months ago into a patient. So we've been able to go pretty rapidly from discovering this new agent to a targeted therapy related to the cancer-causing um, virus. Okay. So the objectives, these are repeated from the website and the objectives for the um, talk today. I won't reread those. Um, and there's me at the bottom, no potential conflicts of interest. So what is Merkel cell? I don't have a laser, so I'm going to be doing this. What is Merkel cell carcinoma? It's a, it's a skin carcinoma. These are some clinical examples here. Um, when it's early, it's relatively painless and asymptomatic, and um, subjects may not seek medical care for these for a while, and um, physicians and even dermatologists may not biopsy them aggressively, and so they may uh, become somewhat advanced before they're diagnosed. Uh, the initial clinical description was in 1972. Um, Merkel, I have a picture of him later, was a, a gentleman from the 19th century, but this is uh, being recognized pathologically as a distinct cancer was in 1972. Um, described as a firm papule or nodule, often red or purple. These are just, you know, this is pretty subtle over here. You can see that this is on the face, and one of the cofactors for this is ultraviolet light. So while I'm going to be spending a lot of time talking about a, a virus, um, the multi-hit hypothesis of carcinogenesis I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, to skip ahead to a bottom line, the Merkel cell cancer um, influences the retinoblastoma protein or RB protein pathway, but there seem to be the requirements for other um, changes, other mutations in the cells, and UV light, as we know, is mutagenic, and so um, the uh, uh, UV-exposed areas are a common site. And in fact, this memnonic has been um, sort of brought forward by Paul Niem, AEIOU, asymptomatic, typically not very painful, expands rapidly. Now, immunosuppressed, come back to that in a second, but um, more than would be expected by chance, patients who get this cancer are immune suppressed. Typically occurs in older individuals um, and the UV exposure. So here's a, on the face, and here's an example of uh, a site on the um, finger. Um, and with regards to this percentage of cases that have these sort of AEIOU um, symptoms, well, very common except for the immune suppressed, 7.8%. But there is a, a proportionally overrepresentation in immune suppressed individuals. The types of immune suppressions include HIV infection, where there's about a 13 fold um, increase, um, transplant uh, patients who are receiving exogenous immune suppressive therapy, and also CLL. So the association between this malignancy and, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia has been recognized for, uh, for quite a while. Um, so. Um, this slide is just to emphasize that people should, should uh, consider biopsy. It can also occur on sun-protected areas. So here's a lesion from HIV-positive patients. And this kind of looks like a staphy carbuncle or something. You're going to give some, you know, give some antibiotics and see if it goes down. Um, but it turned out to be a Merkel cell carcinoma. So um, because of the association with immune suppression, this sounds a lot like Kaposi's sarcoma. And you know, this is another malignancy that was very, very enriched in HIV-positive uh, subjects. And um, it seemed as if there, there might be an infectious agent associated with this uh, malignancy. So this is the paper from Science from just 2008, so about three and a half years ago now, that signaled the sort of discovery of this agent. And this was done with next-generation sequencing. 
several of the family's viruses in this family were discovered with next generation sequencing. And in this case, the, the, the punchline is over here, kind of on the right, is that from a tumor sample, they took total poly A mRNA, made cDNA, and with the deep sequencing that was available in that era, got 400,000 reads. They subtracted out all the human reads. They had some garbage reads that didn't you know, blast to anything, some bacterial and fungal reads. But there was one read that gave a match to an African green monkey polyoma virus. It wasn't a perfect match, but it gave a reasonable homology to this um, uh, veterinary or animal kingdom polyoma virus. So of course, they isolated that, that, that sequence, made a probe from that, and went back and fished out the rest of the genome from um, the tumor specimen and found, lo and behold, that they had a previously unrecognized virus in the polyoma family um, at that time. And in the initial paper in science, they found it in eight, eight out of 10 Merkel cell carcinoma biopsies and in some um, normal control tissues also. These statistics have largely held true now three years later. It's not in 100% of Merkel cell carcinomas. It's in about 80% of them. It affects the RB pathway, as I mentioned. So if you have another mutation or another hit on RB, you don't necessarily need to have this cancer and this virus in there. And this detection in normal tissues um, is not zero, and we'll discuss that a little bit more also. So what about the family of human polyomaviruses? So um, this was the fifth one to be discovered, but there's now nine of them. And you can, if you look at the dates of discovery, you'll see that they're sort of piling up towards the last few years. Um, the um, BK and JC viruses we're familiar with. We do PCRs for them. The syndromes are probably familiar to those of you who are clinically active in the audience. These actually will grow. And so culture isolation in the era in the 70s and the era of culture isolation was possible. And it was really only later that these, the clinical syndromes were associated with these um, agents. Um, 2007, the KI and WU is Washington University. KI is the name of another medical school somewhere. So these viruses are typically named for where they come from. Deep sequencing from immune compromised patients, respiratory secretions. Still not really very well defined what syndromes, if any, of those cause. Merkel cell, which we'll be concentrating on, as mentioned there, 2008. And um, more recently, the 6, 7, and 9 were discovered using an interesting PCR technique, uh, rolling circle amplification, which preferentially amplifies plasmids, or small little closed circles of DNA. So like papillomaviruses, these polyomaviruses, they're about little 5.8 KB circles. They're actually related to papillomaviruses. So imagine a PCR method with degenerate primers where you preferentially amplify all the circles of DNA. And that method has been applied to skin swabs. And lo and behold, several additional um, polyomaviruses, really with unknown clinical significance, have been the, the 6, 7, and 9 here were discovered um, just in the last few years. The eighth one on the list here is associated with trichodysplasia spinulosum, which I'm going to show you some pictures from in a minute. And this is a sort of a, a exophytic um, uh, uh, proliferative disease seen in immune compromised patients and is also related to one of these agents. In terms of the um, phylogeny, um, here's Merkel cell over here. So it's on this large branch associated with um, the other more recently discovered agents, JC and BK, causing kidney problems or brain problems in the immune suppressed are up in their sort of in their own little branch. You may have wondered why, you know, should I be putting SB40 down as a human pathogen or not? Long history, too long to review there. But the polio vaccine, I'm 52, that I got the live polio vaccine when I was a kid on the sugar cube. That was um, raised in cell culture in African green monkey cells. And guess what? All of those cells were infected with SB40. So many of us got sort of dosed and perhaps even subtly infected with SB40. There's some research that some mesothelioma samples could possibly contain SB40 genomes, but I think it's not terribly well accepted or, or uh, not a lot of consensus on that. So um, uh, SB40 is definitely oncogenic in um, uh, rodent systems, but Merkel cell, our topic for today, is really the first known oncogenic uh, member of this family. Uh, comparative phylogenetic analyses, of course, have been done, and I'd just like you to concentrate on the top line here. There's a very simple viruses. They only have a handful of open reading frames, and I'm just illustrating the VP1 here, the external protein uh, capsid uh, uh, protein 1, that these are pretty distinct. The sequences are pretty different between viruses. So the serology data that you'll be seeing in a few minutes, and Mark is working on the serology along with Denise Galloway, is based on recombinant VP1. So while these viruses are all related, the sequences of this external proteins are unique enough that antibodies tend to be um, distinct and can be used to uh, diagnose the serostatus of individuals for infections with these viruses. More recently, people are making 
um, pseudo uh, um, um, virions or self-assembling viral-like proteins. They, they express the VP1 and the VP2 together. They get a self-assembly like we can get with papillomaviruses. Maybe the serology is a little bit better um, if you use these uh, viral-like particles. So this is the other recently recognized syndrome, uh, this trichodysplasia spinulosum. And the, the picture in the middle is from the index case. This is a very rare sort of shaggy, hairy growth disorder seen after transplant in immune-suppressed patients, very rare. And when they do EM, they can actually see viral capsids in these uh, cells. And there's a very high copy number, there's about 10 to the fifth viral DNA copies per cellular copy of DNA. Um, so this is, appears not to be a neoplastic disorder. It's probably a direct infection, and there's a proliferation that's driven by, directly by the infection. Another piece of evidence going in favor of that is the topical sidofovir, which is an antiviral that can inhibit many DNA viruses, is actually effective in treating this disorder. So one of the other newly discovered viruses in this family does have this other rare, um, this rare medical syndrome. As I mentioned in the intro, looking at the context of um, infection-related cancers, Merkel cell indicated in blue down here towards the bottom is only one of a long list thought to, in summary, you know, make up 10 or 15 percent of human cancers. A lot of research, a lot of mechanistic research has gone into every single one of these, and I'm not going to take the time to compare and contrast Merkel cell to all of these, other than to say that it's interesting to think about what other malignancies that we diagnose and work on now could possibly be related to an infectious agent. Okay, so to get a little bit closer look at the genome and start moving towards um, our um, immunology-based research, as I mentioned, these are rather simple um, agents. They're a closed circle of, of DNA. Um, and there's an origin of replication, so that's shown there in red. So that's where the uh, virus um, melts its DNA to start copying its DNA. Um, there's the virion protein 1 that's useful for the yes-no serology that uh, Denise Galloway and, and now Mark are, are working on. And over here on this, this side of the genome really are the structural proteins. So it's very simple. It only has three structural proteins. In terms of the oncogenesis, um, we're really talking about the, uh, this large T protein, and we'll come back to that in a minute. One interesting feature about this virus in the cancers is that there's inevitably a stop or a nonsense mutation um, in the large T protein. So the wild-type virus actually is good at making baby virus. It's good at replicating virus, but it's not oncogenic. So the virus is forced to undergo at least two mutations in order to become oncogenic. And I think I have a picture that will highlight that a little bit more. Um, the large T protein is shown in purple going around the outside. One of its functions is during replication. It basically oligomerizes and sits down on the origin. Actually, 12 of the large T proteins come together, and they sit on the origin. And if there's a mutation or a truncation in the large T, it can no longer sit on the origin. The virus can't replicate anymore. So that virus is dead in terms of its ability to make daughter virus, but unfortunately it also has the ability to cause cell proliferation in that, um, in that stage. And some of the tumor genomes um, end up having additional mutations also. So once this gets integrated, which is how it works, it can end up with additional mutations. So the proteins that drive the cancer really are kind of over in this region. It's that the, um, in purple, the large T antigen, and then its splice variant, the small T antigen, and another splice variant called the 57KT antigen. So off of one piece of DNA, there are a couple of different mRNAs that are possible and a couple of different proteins that can be made. So those are really the problem proteins. And as you might expect, I mentioned the RB protein interaction, that the retinoblastoma interaction region is up here in the N-terminal region. And I'll show you a stick figure in a minute. So the, the oncogenic domain or the RB domain is retained even in the mutated viruses that can cause cancer. Um, and in addition, these regions here, because these are retained in the um, cancer region, these provide potential biomarkers. So in tumors, and I'll show you immunohistology in a minute, there's a lot of these proteins from sort of the upper left. Imagine a monoclonal antibody that binds somewhere up here, heavily expressed in the tumors. So that's a potential diagnostic aid. If I have a monoclonal antibody that I can stain the tumor with. In addition, in the tumor context, there was just a lot of viral protein. There's a tumor mass. There's maybe metastases. There's a fair amount of viral protein, and the immune response seems to react to that by making additional levels of antibodies to large T protein. So the candidate biomarker that Paul has really pioneered and Mark's working on a clinical assay for are antibodies to the large T antigen. So I will come back to that in a minute, and you can just, just don't worry about remember, remembering that for now. Um, a, a little bit of a more of a, of a diagram of the large T protein here. Um, the, 
uh, protein has all sorts of different domains. This is the retinoblastoma binding domain right here. So while mutations are typically somewhere between the two yellow thunderbolts there, the RB binding area, which is involved in carcinogenesis, is, is retained. The small T antigen um, binds to uh, some um, phosphatases, which are probably involved in cell cycle control also. So I'm not going to try to go too deep into the um, uh, oncogenesis, um, you know, the oncogenic mechanisms. But if you take fibroblasts or you take animals and you express the large T alone or the small T alone, you can show loss of anchorage independence and proliferative disorders with both the large T and the small T antigens, both seeming to be involved in the, in the um, carcinogenesis. So as I mentioned, there's inevitably sort of a stop or a nonsense mutation in the genomes um, somewhere um, to the C-terminal side of the retinoblastoma protein binding domain. So we have uh, some sort of protein space, you might say, sort of the proteome. This is probably the expressed proteome that's going to be um, available for either diagnosis or potentially for immunotherapy or immune recognition once these cancers get started. Um, and, um, okay. So just to show you a couple of uh, slides now, and this is a very nice review by the individuals, Yuan Chang and Patrick Moore, who discovered this uh, virus in 2008 in uh, uh, Pathology Review Journal. The same individuals who discovered Kaposi sarcoma, herpes virus, in 1994, and have stayed doggedly on the hunt for new, um, new infectious agents. So in this uh, photomicrograph here, um, this is stroma, stained in blue, and then this is a nest of tumor cells here, and you can see there's pretty um, uniform dark staining for the large T protein. So about 80% um, of these Merkel cell carcinomas um, um, stain with this, uh, this monoclonal antibody. It turns out some of the basic biology for nuclear localization signals going back to the 70s was defined using the SV40 large T antigen, sort of the birth of the concept of a nuclear localization signal. And sure enough, this um, protein has that same strong nuclear localization signal. You can see it's pretty well localized in the, um, um, in the nucleus. Tumor 2 down here is an example, though, from, Yang, uh, from Chang and Moore's more recent work, where not all of the uh, tumors actually express the large T protein, yet it's still a tumor. There's still cancer there. So they've developed additional monoclonal antibodies for the small T, and you can see this is an example of one here where there isn't any large T, but there's a lot of the small T and supports that sort of more mechanistic research that I mentioned earlier about the small T being capable of being um, oncogenic on, on its own. So these antibodies have rapidly sort of been put forward into clinical, uh, into clinical um, service. So just to summarize the um, Merkel cell polyomavirus oncogenesis, it does insert into the host DNA. Um, so uh, um, it actually inserts its genome into one of the chromosomes, but the insertion site seems to differ with each tumor. It seems to be random. So um, it doesn't seem to be an example of um, insertional mutagenesis. Some retrovirus, some lentiviruses, retroviruses cause cancer by inserting next to an antiproliferative gene. They inactivate an antiproliferative gene, so the balance is upset in the cell and the cell proliferates. Also, some, some tumor viruses insert so that their promoter goes in front of a cellular oncogene. So their promoter goes in front of CMYK, for example, where a cellular gene is influenced by a viral promoter or a viral gene is influenced by a cellular promoter. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case for this one either, so it doesn't really insert to change gene regulation. It really seems to be the viral oncoprotein itself, a large T, that, that, uh, or the T proteins that drive things. As I mentioned, so far it's known that the large T protein binds to RB, but there isn't a P53 hit known. Um, papillomavirus, E67 protein, you know all about these. They cause all sorts of SIL and LGSIL and cervical cancer. The E6 and E7 proteins of papillomavirus influence both the RB and the P53 pathway. And adenovirus, which can be transforming in animals, the E1A, E1B proteins, they influence both of those key pathways. Thus far, with Merkel cell, there's no known P53 hit. There is a domain in the um, left-hand portion of the protein, um, sort of shown in blue here, this domain, called the Merkel unique region, or MUR. It's got to be doing something. Everybody wants to know what it is. Nobody knows what it's doing yet. But um, um, so far, no P53. The, the large T must have a truncation mutation in its mid-portion, and that prevents the complete viral replication. If it's not mutated, the virus can replicate, and the cell will pop and it won't go on to cause cancer. Um, I mentioned that small T has unique targets. And as yet, there's no known anti-apoptotic biology. So many tumor viruses, in addition to doing something proliferative, will attack um, a known apoptosis pathway and inhibit apoptosis. There's really no biology for that yet. 
So normal Merkel cells were discovered by this gentleman here, and they're involved in um, light touch. And sort of, they're sort of on that borderline between neuro and endocrine cells. And uh, we know these develop from the same layer embryologically. Um, they're felt to be more of epidermal origin rather than neural crest origin. And um, by histology, they're, they have a, a characteristic cytological marker, cytokeratin 20. And neuroendocrine features such as chromogranin and synaptophysin and S100 protein. So they're similar to some of these other sort of neuroendocrine family tumors such as small cell carcinoma in terms of their, their um, uh, diagnostic uh, um, um, features. So uh, by light microscopy, um, it's said to be in the small round tumor family and diagnoses, uh, differential diagnosis of something that looks like this by light microscopy. Now I'm not a pathologist, sort of like sort of bringing Colts to Newcastle, but the disorders listed here are said to be um, difficult to distinguish from Merkel cell carcinoma um, at the sort of light microscopy level. So immunostains are typically called on to um, assist with the diagnosis. And um, this is a um, uh, chart that lists some of the features. So Merkel cell carcinoma is listed in the first row. And things that are quite useful clinically are cytokeratin 20. I mentioned about 80% of the tumors have virus in them, and almost always they're the CK20 positive ones. So those 20% that don't have the virus in them may also be, be um, negative for the CK20. And uh, neuron-specific enolase, I believe, NSC, so sort of one of the neuronal types of uh, features that are present. And these things are negative for CD45 and thyroid cancer markers, and they're positive for some of these other um, neural markers shown down here. And also for EPCAM on their surface, so this common epithelial cancer antigen is present on the surface at screamingly high levels. We've seen this by flow cytometry. And Dr. Sabbath in the department here is working on a circulating tumor cell assay. So patients who have big lesions in metastatic cells and are leaking cells out into the bloodstream may be detectable by um, uh, um, enriching for EPCAM-positive cells. Because we have the viral PCR also, if you can get whatever has EPCAM on it and PCR it up and show that, yeah, there's a ton of tumor virus DNA in there, I think you have a, a staging concept there for that this virus is actually potentially metastasizing, or at least there are, there are tumor cells in the blood, something to follow for um, during therapy or for prognostic significance also. So it's another activity on this um, agent that's, that's currently underway in the, um, in the, in the department. The, the cytokeratin-20 staining, I guess, is quite unusual compared to the way it normally looks. So in the tumor, there's this perinuclear punctate pattern of the CK20. And my understanding from talking to pathologists and reading about this is that when this is seen, this is quite... Um, quite diagnostic of this disorder. I mentioned the, the um, uh, um, correlation or the enrichment in patients with CLL. And uh, in fact, when PCR hunts, the new tumor virus was discovered, 2008, people started PCRing their, their tumor you know, repositories that they had back in their, in their labs. And sure enough, some of, the C, some of the CLLs started coming up positive. And there was some initial feeling that maybe this could be involved in the pathogenesis of CLL. On a little bit closer examination, it turned out that there were probably mostly cases like this, where there was a coexistence of the disorders even in the, um, in the same biopsy. So this is a sheet, a lymph node with a sheet of CLL, which has nests of Merkel cell carcinoma actually in it, as shown. This is the staining for the large T antigen for the viral protein. Um, I've skipped ahead and not really discussed the epi. So you're saying this is all very exciting, but what's the healthcare burden here? So about 1,500 new cases a year in the United States. How does that compare to melanoma? Melanoma is about 85 to 100,000 new cases in the, uh, a year in the United States. So the healthcare burden uh, is, is comparatively small, but when you look at the attributable mortality, if you're diagnosed with Merkel cell carcinoma, your chances of dying of Merkel cell carcinoma, not dying with it, but dying of it, are about 45%. In contrast, all comers with melanoma, including the superficial spreading ones, but all comers with melanoma, at about a 15% overall case mortality rate. So if I had a choice, I'd probably rather be diagnosed with melanoma than with this because um, it's, it frequently has a severely, has a bad prognosis. Um, as I mentioned, it was only first described back in 1972, and how much of this is uh, ascertainment bias, um, I'm not sure, versus a true increase. But if you look at the statistics of cases that are reported to national registries, there does seem to be a very um, you know, steady uh, increase with our aging population, immune-suppressed individuals, and probably also increasing recognition of this uh, Disorder. It's a big problem in Australia. I think uh, you know, uh, lots of UV light and people without much skin pigment down there also. So that's another leading center for research with this disorder. 
And uh, risk factors, you know, 98% of known patients are Caucasian, the immune suppression and the age. Um, and um, while all comer cancer cases seem to be going, go down with age, this is the association with age with Merkel cell where it really does continue to go um, up and up as people get older and older. I'm thinking about sort of maybe an immune senescence sort of uh, uh, hypothesis. I mentioned in HIV positive patients, 13-fold increase, solid organ transplant, and a 30 to 50-fold increase in patients with CLL. So pretty strongly linked. So what about the virus? I mean, I'm an infectious disease guy. I'm talking all this cancer stuff, but let's get back to our roots here with the, uh, you know, just actually talking about the, the you know, um, descriptive epidemiology of this. And these are the results of uh, Luminex-based multiplex serology developed by Denise Galloway at the Hutch. It's really wonderful technology. I mentioned that the VP1, the variant protein 1, is quite sequence divergent. So Denise expressed all of these with a uh, capture. I think it was a uh, six hiss. And then using um, metal beads, uh, metal-coated beads, she was able to create microbeads that contained these antigens. So each one of these different antigens, you can see five different viruses here. The principle of Luminex, as you know, is each one of these bead populations is very precisely and evenly milled, has perfectly consistent size, perfectly consistent fluorescence. Okay? So I'm just going to take some of my diluted serum, put it in with the bead cocktail, wash, get rid of the unbound IgG, come in with the fluorescent second antibody, wash, get rid of the excess stuff, and basically run the stuff through the flow cytometer. So each dot here is a human being, and as I run those beads for the flow cyt through the flow cytometer, I'm going to get a mean fluorescence intensity. So this is a number that those of you who are in hematopathology might, might be more used to thinking about the average brightness of the events. They're not cells here, but they're microbeads as the microbeads go past the flow cytometer. And let's take a look at JC virus here for a minute. So this causes multifocal leukoencephalopathy in HIV patients. Yeah, there's some slop in the middle, but there's a population that are negative that have a low mean fluorescence intensity and a population that are positive. And the overall seroprevalence here in this example was about 45%. So again, each, each dot here is a unique human being tested for the panel of five different viruses. BK virus causing the um, nephritis in the renal transplant patients, very ubiquitous, almost everybody's infected. Washington University virus and the Kansas City Institute virus or whatever it is, pretty much ubiquitous. And the data, I think, are pretty, um, are sorting out most labs between 50, 70 percent for Merkel cell polyoma virus. That it's, it's, you know, it's a ubiquitous agent. We're almost all infected um, with this, or very many people are infected. Age prevalent studies of going back and looking at banked sera from pediatric, you know, banks from previous studies make it look like most people are infected um, in the preteen to early teenage years. So the seroprevalence by ages 13 to 17 is pretty much the same as the seroprevalence in um, adults. Nothing's really known about how this is transmitted, but it's presumed to be saliva or a close contact um, because of the age of acquisition, um, age, of, age of seroconversion. As I mentioned, the serology that uses the viral-like particles, the V1, V2 together, maybe, maybe that's a little bit better, and maybe the seroprevalence is going to go up a little bit um, with, with some of that other serology. Nonetheless, if you look at patients with Merkel cell cancer, so here's the 76 cases and 41 controls, the seroprevalence is higher in individuals who have the virus than individuals who don't. So weak evidence, but you can see the other viruses in the family are about even, Stephen. And there is a, there is a statistical association between you know, having the infection and uh, having this disorder. So what about prognostic features, and especially given the, the virus? So um, these are some of the newer um, uh, um, features that have been um, uh, correlated with... Uh, with, with prognosis. Uh, Dan, as I mentioned, is working on the one on the bottom that I think is still pretty, you know, pretty experimental. Uh, one thing that Paul Niem showed was that you really need to do a sentinel node biopsy in this disorder. So you may even see these specimens coming your way that when they added the information from um, sentinel node biopsy to the clinical evaluation of the draining lymph node, they were able to get significant additional prognostic information. Up until recently, this disorder really didn't have a good TNM system or a good staging system. And, and I think it's pretty well accepted now that you need to do, a, um, uh, if you can, anatomically do a sentinel node biopsy to give additional um, prognostic information. Starting to merge into research now that I was a little bit more directly involved with, um, we've also had a chance to go back to tissue and look at the gene expression um, profiles. So these, um, this was a collaboration with Rosetta, which was a branch of Merck and which has closed down, unfortunately, since then. But Rosetta was able to gratis do these gene expression arrays on um, many, many samples that, uh, that Paul had collected. And these are grouped here with good prognosis, moderate prognosis, and poor prognosis. So this was the actual natural history, the, the, the outcome data uh, for these individuals. 
And um, this should be outcome, good, moderate, and poor outcome. And you can sort of see a grouping of purple here of some genes that may be enriched in individuals with a, with a better outcome. And some of these are listed over here on the right. And without going into details, you see things like granzymes. These are typically expressed in cytotoxic T cells or NK cells. So thinking about an immune infiltrate or a possible immune response against the virus. Um, interferon is also present in there. Um, and T cell receptor betas and um, chemokines that are involved in calling um, lymphocytes into tumors. So the, the families that were enriched are things like immune system, immune response, defense response, et cetera. So this kind of gave a, a hint that there could be an immune correlate with the, um, with the prognosis. And so uh, to follow that up, a blinded study was done in which um, the tumors in a tumor microarray, a tissue microarray, were stained with anti-CD8. And these are some examples here of some of the uh, patterns that we're seeing of looking for cytotoxic T cells, so potentially helpful cells of the immune system actually infiltrating the tumor. An example of one that's heavily infiltrated by CD8 cells, moderately infiltrated, and basically they're missing down here. And these are the actual prognostic, uh, prob pardon me, outcome data for those individuals correlated with the um, T cell infiltrate, uh, sort of backing up the microarray data and supporting a hypothesis that an immune response against the agent, potentially against the virus, um, might be helpful. Um, and this is just a little brief wave introduction to r remind us all how T cells see, let's say, a tumor cell. So if this is a tumor cell here with an HLA molecule on the surface, we'll imagine this is a tumor peptide. It could be a viral peptide. It could be an uh, overexpressed self-protein. Uh, like in melanoma, MART1, or NYASO present on the surface. Here's an infiltrating CD8 T cell on the bottom. It has a T cell receptor that may recognize um, the tumor cell, and if it recognizes, may be able to uh, do something effective. What about um, immune responses on the antibody side? So um, I mentioned that the, the antibody data that we looked at earlier was against that capsid protein, that external protein. I've, if you remember the immunocytochemistries from the last couple of slides, some of those things that were almost black, like a wall of tumor antigen, that's a wall of big T antigen, well, you might hypothesize that those individuals might make more antibodies against the big T antigen. They got more antigen, maybe they're going to have more antibodies. So this is a yes-no population prevalence study of um, the detection of large T antigen. And over here are cases of patients with Merkel cell carcinoma. About 30 or 40 percent of them have antibodies to large T antigen. These 530 people over here, 60% of them are infected with the virus. They just don't have antibodies um, against the uh, tumor antigen. So this was followed up in longitudinal research uh, by Paul. And um, this is some examples of untreated patients over here on the left. So this is the titer of the, I'm sorry, pardon me, treated patients. This is that viral protein 1, which was the, the surface protein. And notice how the titers don't really change. The day of diagnosis is over here on day 0. But when patients get diagnosed and then they get treated, typically the antibody titer against the large T protein declines. So it appears to be a relatively simple-minded case of we're removing the antigen. The antigen's being exteriorized from the person's body. The immune response is turning down. It's like treating syphilis or treating Lyme disease. It's one of these, one of these cases of an infectious or an antigen load where when the antigen load goes down, the, and the antibody response goes down. And in, in follow-up work that um, Paul has done, he's in the process of trying to turn this into a uh, a test for relapse, test for cure and following patients for possibility of relapse. So this is an example of a case here where a patient had no apparent disease, then they were diagnosed with a metastasis. At that point, the antibody level was higher. And then when, after they were treated, the antibody level went back down. Um, these are three examples of patients who had disease progression at the time of the second blood draw with the antibody level at the first blood draw and the antibody level at the um, second draw. And here are two additional examples of patients here who had increased antibody levels at the time that they had metastatic disease. So while the number of individuals is relatively small here, one of Dr. Niem, Paul Niem's uh, great strengths is his repository and database. And he's literally spent five figures building an access database and has freezers and freezers full of samples. So in R01 funding, he was recently able to obtain that I'm a small bit player on. He's able to now go back to those um, serum banks together with the prognostic information and try to flesh this out um, in greater detail, and, and Mark in your department is moving towards moving this um, into a, a, a potentially a clinical platform. So what about immune-based therapy? So I'm going to just talk about two things here in the last few minutes. One is non-specifically jacking up the immune response, um, saying that, okay, the, immune the CD8 T cells may be trying to get in. If we could increase this, perhaps with interferon, would that help? And then finally, with the adoptive T cell therapy, which is the part that I've been the most um, directly involved with, where we actually have treated a patient. 
So to get to the punchline here, three years from discovery of the virus, we've actually grown up Merkel cell cancer uh, to, uh, um, virus specific T cells and infused those into, uh, into a patient. So this is an example of what sort of the tissue microarray um, can look like for the, this is the large T protein. So each one of these is from a different person. This is stained for the Merkel cell um, um, antigen, the large, T, the large T antigen. So you might say, okay, this is a non-self protein. This is high level expression of a non-self protein. People shouldn't be tolerant to this protein. They weren't born with it. If we can do something to enhance the immune response to this non-self viral protein, maybe we can have sort of an immune rejection type phenomenon of the cancer. For those of you who work in this area, you know that cancer modulation of immunity and the problem of what is poisoned or what is wrong with tumor-specific T cells is a very deep and rich topic, and there are many mechanisms that are known or hypothesized here, all of which are in play. But just think about it here in the more simple, I think, version now of this is possible and we'd like to maybe jack it up. Um, one problem that occurs in some of these tumors is that there's loss of HLA class 1. So here's an example of the tumor. Here's the tumor mass. There's good expression of HLA. But many of the tumors actually look like this. The tumor cells kind of look the same. There's still HLA class 1 on the stroma, but the actual tumor cells themselves had an HLA class 1 loss. So these cells are going to be invisible to CD8 T cells. It doesn't matter how much I immunize the patient or pour in CD8s, they're not going to be able to see the tumor cells. It turns out this is interferon reversible. So we've shown this with cell lines. Um, that if we put interferon on these cells, they'll re-express the HLA class 1. They haven't irreversibly lost it. And um, this is, these are some slides from a patient that Paul treated with interferon. So this is just the H and E from before interferon over here on the left and after interferon on the right. And you can see that while there's still tumor nests that they've um, decreased in size, there's less tumor there. This is the HLA class 1 level. So this is an example of a patient who had poor or scanty HLA class 1 present on the tumor cells prior to therapy, and we used the beta uh, serum. It's the stuff that's used for multiple sclerosis and was um, just injected directly into the tumor mass uh, multiple times. And, you know, very strong expression of the HLA class 1 after, um, after uh, um, infusion. And so here's sort of the punchline, which is the um, CD8 T cell exp in infiltration. There are really no CD8 T cells in the tumor here prior to the um, injections. But after the injections, we're staining with anti-CD8 here and can see reasonable outlines that, um, you know, very complex cascades of events with chemokines and so forth have inevitably gone on here. But at the end of the day, we've gotten some CD8 T cells into the tumor, which is, which is what we want. Clinically, this has been, you know, moderately successful. I don't, I'm not an oncologist, and I don't want to try to summarize Paul's treatment data, but many patients have had complete or partial responses, and he's got an open clinical trial going on at this point um, with uh, using an FDA-approved compound just for a new indication that sort of makes sense biologically here. Okay, so, and to finish up with my most direct lab involvement, we started looking for T cells. So those of you who know me from previous lectures know I'm like the epitope guy, the CD8 guy, discover CD8 T cells. When this virus was, came out in 2008, we thought, okay, we can really take apart the T cell response to this virus pretty quickly. And in contrast to herpes simplex with 77 open reading frames, this virus really only has a small number of open reading frames. The business end, and again going up here where this large T and small T is, this is the part we really care about up here uh, in terms of finding T cell responses really to that fairly restricted peptidome. So what we did in this case is we just made overlapping peptides that covered the, region of the, the regions of interest because this was relatively restricted. In total, we're talking about six or 700 amino acids of protein total. The small T antigen, the large T antigen kind of all together, the part that we really care about. And we used a variety of modern technologies to figure out which peptides were being recognized. Um, and we used interferon gamma as a readout. So here's some example of our raw data here where we're taking TILs, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We took a biopsy throughout the T cells. And when we put in one single peptide, we get 3% of the cells turning on and being positive. We could follow that up with doing Ella spots. I know you've seen these kinds of assays before where with no peptide, there's no dots. When we put in the specific peptide from the tumor virus, there's lots of dots. So we can show that there's, there's reactivity with that particular peptide. Um, and um, we were able to winnow it down, and this is the treatment case, to this one 10 amino acid peptide. So this is a synthetic peptide here that we can purchase. And we explored the cross-reactivity with the other homologs. So these are a bunch of the other Merkel cell viruses listed down across the bottom here. We lined up the proteins. We made the homologous peptide. They weren't reactive, so only the peptide from the Merkel cell virus was, was uh, recognized in this case. 
And um, we then made a tetramer. So this is a fluorescent antibody type of reagent you can go in and stain blood with. And sure enough, when we stain the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, 4% of them were reactive with this um, uh, peptide. This is really kind of the punchline here leading towards treatment in just my last slide or two. We went back into the PBMCs of this patient, and when we probed the PBMC with this, this specific reagent now, so this reagent is fluorescent, it's only going to bind the Merkel cell polyomavirus specific T cells, so only the host cells that react with this virus, 0.14% of the cells were positive. So a lot more than zero, enough to sort out. So what we did was we sorted out those cells, and um, this is just a little bit about their phenotype, they're a little bit exhausted. But what we did, and this was really the work of Cassie and Yi and Audie in, in his lab, was these cells were sorted out and then they were expanded in the lab in a highly efficient method using mitogens and cytokines to make literally billions, literally hundreds of billions of these cells were grown up. And this is what the product that was actually infused in the patient looked like when we stained it with the tetramer. So again, we're staining with the tetramer on the y-axis. We've gone from the 0.14% tumor virus specific T cells up to 86% tumor virus specific T cells. And so this was in a sterile FDA approved sort of cell therapy product and was actually infused into um, this particular subject here. So these are some PET scans of this individual and this mass on the pancreas. This guy had had a Merkel cell carcinoma on the skin and had been excised and radiated. Um, in the serological follow-up that I had mentioned before, after his therapy, his level of antibodies went down, but then the levels of antibody were detected to be going back up. So that provoked the PET scans, which showed the, um, this suspicious-looking mass. So about six weeks ago, the gastroenterologists actually were able to snake down through the uh, mouth and down to the duodenum, and they injected that mass with interferon 24 hours before the cells were given, the theory being that it would jack up the HLA level on the tumor mass prior to the therapy, a biopsy was done at the same time. And yes, the biopsy was Merkel cell. It wasn't some other pancreatoma, Ditzel, or some other thing. So it was, in fact, metastatic Merkel cell. And an interferon injection was given. And then the patient was um, uh, treated with 23 billion cells intravenously that were uh, purified and enriched by the methods that I described. And th this is an example of the tracking of the patient's cells after um, uh, the day of infusion. So the patients, the, the, they went up to about a 6% abundance in the blood. So many of the cells were given that, um, you know, eight days after therapy, 6% of the cells in the whole blood were the cells that, that, that were given. And they were shown to enter the cell cycle and also be secreting cytokines. So they looked like they were activated and proliferating in the body of the subject. Again, I don't want to steal, you know, the thunder or anything of all the oncologists and the, the giant team that did all of this therapeutic work. And I'm not really qualified to state the details anyway. But the patient is doing fine. There is, has been some response. Um, by this tumor mass, and the patient's been retreated, actually. The second time around, they gave radiation therapy to the tumor masses. Low-dose radiation therapy also enhances HLA expression, causes some local tissue inflammation, also jacks up immune recognition. The patient was retreated with a second dose of these cells, and, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting to see what's going to happen with the, with the patient. So I'd just like to sort of close by acknowledging the huge body of people who were involved with this um, research, and really led by Paul Niem, who's a associate professor in medicine, dermatology. He's based down at South Lake Union. Um, and all of the people in his lab, Olga and Jaysri, especially a current MD-PhD student and a postdoc, um, um, Jaysri, who were involved with my lab with the, with the peptide and antigen discovery and tetramer um, definition. Um, so these are the folks in my lab, really um, led by um, Li Chun and by Angela and Chris um, in the, pinning down all the details required to, to find these T cells. The T cells for therapy that Cassie and Yee is a full professor in oncology, many of you probably know, has really um, been doing a lot of this adoptive cellular therapy and has the FDA approved methods of growing cells. I mean, it's an amazing infrastructure. Denise Galloway um, really took the lead in developing that serology based on the capsids that I described. And then many clinicians, the, our oncologic surgeon David Bird involved in um, uh, obtaining the samples. And, radiation therapists and GI doctors and other people who are all part of the treatment team for this one particular case. So let me um, wrap up there, taking you sort of through a multidisciplinary rapid look at a newly discovered cancer. And uh, what's been fun for me, because I've worked with all these different people, and really to just be part of this team that's been quickly able to translate something from discovery, actually, into a, into a treatment. You mentioned at, towards the end of your talk that when you used the CD8 therapy that there was a decrease in the antibody response to large T. 
Um, I'm not sure that's quite what I meant to. If that's what you understood, I was unclear in my presentation. The, the, actually, the increase in the large T antibodies signaled, in this case, the possibility of a relapse or metastases. So in this case, prior to giving the CD8 therapy, prior to getting geared up for that, um, the, uh, on the research basis, Paul and his team noted that the anti-large T antibodies were going up and said, uh-oh, we've seen this before when patients are going to have a metastasis or maybe going to have a relapse. That triggered the scan. The scan showed uh, this pancreatic mass. And because we had done a lot of discovery research on this patient, we were poised, actually, to have the tetramer ready and have the cells ready. Um, and when this patient did relapse, I um, mean, this was really um, sort of a... Um, serendipitous research here plan put together a little bit at the last minute. We had this patient that we knew about the T cells. We had the T cells ready to grow. Yes, the patient did relapse, and that diagnosis was enabled by the serologic tools. Um, we were ready to go at that point. Okay. So my question is if you back up a little bit, yes. because you talked about the immunohistochemical chemical detection of CD8. And, and, and that's, that's good prognosis, yes and then also the diagnostic utility of serology for large T. Yes. What's the correlation between the, those two? Um, the, um, we have more data on the CD8 infiltration being a good, uh, good prognostic factor, and so um, those patients um, would be expected, if we followed them with large T antigen, large T antibodies, to have a decrease in their titer and to not have late increases because they have good prognosis and they're not going to have late metastases or relapses. So that, in fact, that correlation has been seen so far. I think you may be asking is, can you put together a, uh, a multi-parametric sort of score using these different prognostic factors? And um, uh, I can't speak directly to that. That's not really my direct area of involvement with this. But I know that Paul is looking for, for biomarkers. and. That this is just being one of the potential biomarkers, the two potential biomarkers, the antibodies and also the characteristics of the infiltrate. So second part of the question is, in addition to antibodies to large T, mm -hmm. are there antibody responses that <coughs> in patients that get this, mm -hmm. these tumors to other viral proteins or even self-proteins, because you showed that nice image of right. cytokeratin, but right. even though that's a self-protein in the context of sure. the inflammatory lesion of the tumor. You sure. Might. The, um, there's some evidence for overexpression of survivin in these um, tumors, and there are uh, therapies directed at survivin, such as adoptive T cell therapy. So while I think that there's overexpression of, um, of other self proteins that could be, be targets either for small molecules or for immunotherapy, um, um, uh, this disorder is not associated with perineoplastic syndromes or autoantibodies that I'm aware of, unlike some other cancers which seem to sort of stimulate a whole panel of autoantibodies. And there are no other um, autoantibody levels that I'm aware of that are of significance or known with this, with this cancer. Jiro? Yeah, that's a great talk. So um, my question is really um, whether or not you're working on identifying the major CD8 epitopes of course. And, then, and then developing a, a vaccine. <clears throat> So the, the chair was asking, well, what else can you do with this? We know that this protein is immunogenic and that the immune response is trying. I mean, to me, the punchline is some of these patients with this tumor, our body is trying. And there, there's local enrichment, 5, 10, 15 percent of those CD8s in the cancer. I didn't show you all of our epitopes and everything, but are actually recognizing a large T protein. So what can we, what can we do about this? What we'd like to do, what I'd like to do is give the long peptide therapy like was done for HPV-associated vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. So there was a New England Journal article two years ago, patients with these pre-malignant vaginal HPV-related lesions, they treated them with E6 and E7 protein with uh, Freund's, basically, in people. And you can't give Freund's in the United States, but the idea would be you would give a strong adjuvant and sort of hyperimmunize against the tumor antigen. To me, that makes a lot of sense in this case, that we need to overcome Tregs, overcome an immunosuppressive uh, local environment, and um, uh, that would be sort of an active immunotherapy. Passive immunotherapy is giving cells, like I showed the example here. This is unbelievably expensive. I, mean, I think this is at least five figures um, getting into this here. You have to have the HLA match, the self cells, probably not widely practical. But as a, as a halfway measure there, what Paul's working on are something called um, star reagents. This is a soluble T cell receptor. So it's an off-the-shelf product. It's a T cell receptor that can recognize the HLA peptide and then has a toxin bound to the back end. 
Okay, so it still needs to be HLA matched to the patient, but it's still something you can pull out of the freezer, which is HLA appropriate for the patient. It's a high affinity T cell receptor that recognizes the peptide HLA combination that's going to be seen within that patient's tumor with the tumor toxin on it. And so there's small business entities and you know, research labs working in that kind of hybrid between passive immunization and active immunization. So in, in Paul's grant, R01, that he just got that I'm a participant on, we're basically going to beat the T cell response to death against this protein. And I want to, that can get a little boring. And so I thought I'd present a little bit more of the big picture today rather than we got this peptide and we got this peptide. But we're actively you know, going down that road. Mark. Um, what about looking using uh, LA spot or just gamma re uh, interferon mm -hmm. release? Can you detect the CD8 responsive cells in the circuit in the first? Well, that's an interesting point, Mark. So, you know, maybe that would be diagnostic. It turns out that these CD8 T cells, we can detect them with the tetramer in the blood. They're there. We can bind this sort of antibody like reagent and see that 0.14% if you remember that. But if we ask them to perform in the direct PBMCs, make interferon or do something sort of antivirally, they seem paralyzed. They seem sort of dead. And so we're in this sort of realm of exhausted or energized or senescent. You can put different adjectives on it, T cells. And um, that is, I think, part of the problem. You know, if these T cells were so effective and the patients have them in the blood, why do they still have the cancer? So in the ex vivo culture where we're amplifying them, we're also giving them cytokines and sort of releasing them away from bad humors, you know, that are present in the person's body and hopefully recreating effector cells that will be effective when they go back in. So um, thus far, our direct PBMC LS spots and direct, you know, ex vivo tests for effector functions, we actually can't find them. And even when the disease is under good control? Even when the disease is under good control. Yeah, so that's, it's one of the more subtleties about this. But yeah, the cells are there, but they're not working um, so well in the cancer patients. Time frame between the rise in the antibody level and mm -hmm. the clinically apparent neoplasm, whether or not it's you know radiographic or on the skin. Um, so far, that's not really been addressed uh, prospectively, and I think that's that's research that's really coming up of of um, calling people back in once they have the rises. So in this case, it's typically retrospective research of patients who, once there's a problem, they're brought back in. We happen to get a blood sample, goes in the repository, and we. We don't have a lot of time points to really address your question. Did you show the images from the patient mm -hmm. who had the, did I misunderstand, had the antibody detected? Yes, that was about, it took about two months to get the patient in between when the antibodies were back up and when that, when that PET scan. But there was a, you know, one and a half centimeter or something mass at that point. So that thing must have been there for a while. What about the skin lesion right. that you showed that you, you know, you guys had injected right. the interferon. Right. Did that patient have elevated antibody before? I thought that um, I, I misunderstood. I, I don't, um, the, those pictures that, or the, the graphs that showed that antibody levels declining, those were in the context of sort of extirpative therapy, if I said that correctly. So um, surgery, complete excisional surgery followed by local radiation. I don't think that Paul has any real longitudinal data yet on whether the local interferon will lead to declines in, in, in antibody levels. You know, the, the frontline therapy for this, and I really didn't try to go into the therapy, not an oncologist, but it's to remove the whole damn thing and, and radiate it. And then the problem is that just it recurs um, internally, recurs metastatically a reasonable proportion of the time.